Well, I'm a, a wife, a mother, a grandmother. Kept busy most of the time. But saying that, I'm here for the last 44 years and enjoyed, always enjoyed anything to do with um, craft and design. And I suppose that's why I, when I heard about the Bow Slaves, I got interested in it. I come from a family with at least three generations of Carrick and Cross lace makers before me, with uh, grannies, uh, my mother, aunts and cousins on both sides of my family known to have made lace. In spite of this family history and also in spite of being surrounded as a young girl by family and neighbours who were all making lace, I'm afraid at that time I didn't really have an interest in sewing myself. Now um, I have more time now that I'm retired um, and I have attended a couple of classes and workshops in Cullaville with the South Armagh Lace Collective with my niece Rosie Finnegan Bell as one of the tutors keeping it in the family, so to speak. My name is Mary Ryan. I'm originally from Balliol and Coresbridge and moved to Burris in 1977 when I got married. I have always had a keen interest in knitting, sewing and embroidery. I grew up in a house where my mother was a dressmaker and she passed on her skills to each of us. As a young teenager, I learned how to do Carrick Macross lace we made lace mantillas which we wore to mass as it was compulsory then to wear a head covering. My name is Carmel Fern. I was originally from family, quite close to Cullerville, the home of Carrick and Cross Lace. My early memories of Carrick and Cross Lace was a neighbour of ours, Agnes Martin, was doing a piece for the Pope and of course it was of great interest in the area. Now, I don't actually remember what the piece was. I was very young, eight or nine at the time, or I don't even remember seeing it, but it was a great source of conversation. Uh, I got into lace making kind of by accident. I saw a post on Facebook in March 2017 about the Burris lace makers and they were having a meeting in Burris and I went down to see what was going on down there. Um, I was interested in it because my, fam my father's family all came from Burris and when I went down and saw how beautiful the lace was um, I was interested in becoming part of the group. Um, and having joined the group I found later that one of my relations was actually one of the earliest lace makers, Bridget Quinn. She, Bridget was originally from Gore's Bridge but when she married Thomas Quinn in 1922 she moved to Fairview and Burris and had her family there and lived the rest of her life there and she was one she was a lace maker and when she passed away in the early 1980s her family when they were um, sorting out her possessions they came across a wooden box that contained pa patterns and different pieces of um, lace making equipment and um, her family had preserved um, her, her lace making equipment and I think they're very proud to have it in their family. I'm Anne Hughes and I live in Cullerville, just directly across the road from the old lace school that on the concession road in Cullerville. Uh, I, my interest in lace comes from my great aunt Agnes Martin and my own mother who then taught me how to do the lace. So, I can remember at the age of eight and nine visiting her in her little cottage, uh, watching her doing the sewing, take, going over to Carmel Cross with her to lead the sewing into the uh, nuns in the Lily Convent. So I suppose I would have learned it at maybe the age of 10 or 11. Then I got out of the way of doing it and it's only in the last, I suppose, two years that I have really got back to it. Um, so it's something that you you probably don't forget how to do, but I needed a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of games, and I have started back to do a lace class. So within the last two, two years, year and a half, I have completed maybe five or six uh, pieces. Uh, I've done a selection of Christmas baubles. I keep some of the pieces at home, and I have given others away as presents. So uh, I suppose I would have some at home. We, we were at um, Writers Week 
which last year in Boris and um, the lace maker had an open day so I called in there and was admiring all the pieces that people had done thinking I'd never be able to do that but um, <clears throat> lots of people encouraged me and with their encouragement and support I started um, last year yeah and um, yeah I really enjoyed it so I like needlework and crafts that kind of thing so um, yeah so I'm still there <laughs> Now my name is Kate O'Hallan and I live in Uri, I come from Uri, but my parents, my mother and father both came from South Armagh. My mother was from Critter, just out the road from Cullerville, and my father from Credit. Um, I first came to Cat Crossing as I did in my first lesson in 1982, 83 with Rose Feeney in um, Uri F.E. College and I, I've loved doing it ever since. Well, my name is Crea and I live in the townland of Ballynatton in Boris, County Carlow. I'm actually only in Boris around nine years, so I'm a newcomer. Because I didn't really know that many people, you know, I still hadn't got to know many people, um, I decided I'd join, so I did, and I met Helena McAteer there, and she was um, talking about the lace and she asked me would I be interested. So uh, I thought about it for a while and then I said, yeah, okay. So I, I, I joined the Boris Lace Group in 2016 and I'm still with the Boris Lace Group. And um, I have to say it took me quite a while to get the stitches. You know, I was waiting for this eureka moment and it eventually came. And after that, I, I um, kept going and I also decided that I mean the patterns from Boris House are beautiful but I decided to go into the 21st century and I, I kind of drew up a couple of my own patterns. Hi my name is Claire O'Toole and I'm from upstate New York. I'm one of the more recent members of the Boris Lace Makers and um, I just joined in October of last year uh, 2019 for their lace making day at Boris House, which was fabulous and I really enjoyed it. And uh, so that was my start. And I met up with the ladies on Wednesdays uh, when I could to learn some of the basic st stitches and, um, and uh, I got kind of stuck in it. Um, my piece of lace for the, the wall hanging was the jug. Um, it was inspired by nature um, when the Lockdown came, I think like many people, I started walking a lot out by the River Barrow which is nearer to my home and at that time it was the spring of course and there was lots of ducks and wildlife on the river and there was baby ducks so I started posting pictures on our lace whatsapp group uh, of ducks and different aspects of nature I suppose and um, when it came to choosing our piece then for the wall hanging I chose the duck. Um, the design for my duck was um, created by Br Brian Mulvaney and he did the drawing for it and I enjoyed making the lace on it. The piece that I did for this project is a shield in the gate and I thought it would be unusual in that I'd never seen a shield in the gate in, done in the lace before. And it's a very striking image, an image of a woman. And this female figure represented um, the strength of the woman, the fertility of women, um, and many of them that remained are so rubbed away that it was obvious that as people passed them, they would rub them for good luck and for vitality and for life and energy. So I thought, considering the project was um, uh, celebrating the skills and the crafts of women, that a shield and a gig might be an appropriate motif for one of the blocks. So I, I did the shield in the gig. I think the name in itself, the celebration bells, I think it is this is something to celebrate. The fact that um, Boris Lace has got to this stage and is getting out and about and being recognised. And I think that name when I heard it I said it'd be a nice one to have on the quilt. And also 
when doing it I thought the shape of it I could get a good few of the lace stitches into it that's why I say I picked it for my piece uh, for the wall hanging I have taken as my inspiration a photograph uh, of my great aunt Bessie who uh, it was sewing lace sitting by her fireside in her wee cottage in the townland of Monagilla. This uh, photograph was taken by the Northern Ireland Tourist Board in, I think it was 1970, the year before uh, Bessie died, and is now in the National Museum's Northern Ireland collection. But uh, I was really surprised to uh, be asked to join this project because I am quite new at it and uh, I really had a decent grasp of the basics but there was a lot of stitches that I that I had to learn along the way. So uh, I really enjoyed the project. I really loved the dove. I loved that um, piece. I thought it was just beautifully laid out and uh, it's just a big honour to be participating in this um, project and um, I, I really do hope um, it's just the beginning for me. I, I have so much to learn still, and I'm really looking forward to um, <laughs> perfecting some of those stitches and projects to come. So I'm delighted to be part of it. I'm honored to be part of it. And uh, there's such beautiful pieces of lace um, exhibited. And uh, it's just really something else to, to have my little piece up there with, with all of these wonderful, wonderful works of art. The piece I chose was um, a replica of the old lace school, which still stands just outside Pulleville, and I thought it would be nice to do that. That was why I chose it. For the piece of lace for the common thread wall hanging, I choose a traditional piece, which is the lace doily. It's one of my favourite pieces, and I've actually done it in different some different forms. Well, I go, uh, I'm in a drum circle and I go every week. Um, there's not very many of us in it, so we're actually good friends. And I, um, it's the highlight of my life, of my week rather, is going to the drum circle. And um, uh, Brian Mulvaney actually uh, drew out the pattern for me for the drums. And I, I thought, oh yeah, I'll do this. Now I have to say it was quite hard, but I, I finally got it in the end and um, so that's my ins inspiration is my drumming. It, it's, the it's one of the original pieces that they used in um, going back in Lady Harry's time that they would have used to teach um, the girls how to sew, how to do the lace work so I quite liked that idea and um, yeah, I think it's nice to keep up the tradition, if we can at all. It's a bit pity to let it, to let it go. I think like many people, um, we kind of went back to more traditional crafts, like baking and knitting and all different aspects of crafts. So like, I think for me, like a lot of people, I suppose, I find creating and, and handcrafts very calming and relaxing and lace, to make burris lace you really need to concentrate so it's kind of a mindful craft and like during the, the lockdown I find it very, found it very calming and I enjoyed spending time on different pieces and particularly I enjoyed making the duck for the quilt and that kind of collaboration between ourselves and, and the group in the north it was really something significant to be doing at a time when we were all really very much confined to our own homes. Uh, no, during the lockdown I did loads of different pieces, um, uh, particularly I did four of the wedding ring cushions. Just bring it closer into that. Um, I have a daughter and four nieces and a nephew getting married next year, so I decided to do one for each of them. I actually found it very relaxing to do the Boris lace during the lockdown. It took my mind off what was going on in the news. It's been very good actually. I've finished some unfinished projects and did quite a lot of little bothers for Christmas, which is a nice little present for people at Christmas. It's been a great pastime for me. During lockdown, it's been great actually. Uh, I have to 
admit that I did hardly any lace during the lockdown and I, I, I get distracted very easily. So I kind of veered off and I made a couple of dolls <laughs> during the time that we were in lockdown. So that kept me going. For the future of Boris Lease, I'd like to see it expanding more, maybe including more younger and older people. Um, it would be nice to carry on the tradition and maybe pass it on to my own daughter and my granddaughter. So I think it's important that we do have some relationship, cross-border relationship with the Boris group so that um, we can see what, what kind of lace they produce and uh, it's a good social thing as well so that people can uh, um, have some uh, community association with the lace. Um, it's important, I think, to keep old crafts alive because I think in this day and age, the younger generation don't really appreciate or would take the time to actually sit to do those pieces. So for me, my young children would look at me spending hours and hours creating a piece and hopefully they'll appreciate that as they get older, uh, that uh, you know it's good to have uh, to take the time to think and to to enjoy doing creative work. I think that Boris lace making has come on so much over the past few years. I think at, at the moment we're all very much aware of preserving traditional crafts and keeping them alive for future generations. I think especially at, the, at this time with the pandemic and everything, we are very conscious of, you know, things that once we thought were certain are not certain anymore. And I think like that with keeping crafts alive that, you know, for the next generation, it is very important. And I think our group is so, so energetic, I suppose, and so involved in many different areas, that, you know, of promoting lace into the community, like our exhibitions, our lectures, our workshops, in, in many ways, like we're, we've really done so much work in bringing, in promoting Boris Lace, and I think that, I think that will keep going into the future. Finally, I would say, for the way forward with the lace, I think several things, I think we do need to develop our designs, our techniques, the forms of the lace that we will, will make, use our imagination, make it contemporary, um, enticing younger, skilled, young, creative, artistic people who will help with, with all of that work. And I think it has still got the same potential as before as a therapy as something that's good for your emotions and for your personal feelings within yourself and also because I think it, um, the skills that are involved in, it, in them are so delicate and so wonderful. Not everybody can do it and certainly not everybody can do it well. So it, it should be an admired skill and then just to see ways for it to be of use to be used as well. I, I would like to see that. But we clearly need in the future, there's a future part, but I, I think in order for there to be a future, we need to archive the past, we need to record what has happened in the past and as it's happening, and we need to um, encourage younger people to, to join in and to learn how to do it. Yeah, I hope the lease continues and that we don't let it die out, that we pass it on to our children because it's a lovely tradition and um, a very worthwhile pastime as well. Yeah. I would hope now this cross border project would bring it into the fore again and it gets lots of publicity and younger people might get interested in it now. That would be what I would hope. It's great to meet people from another community and see what they've been doing and compare our project with theirs. You know, it's a social event for the whole lot. Yeah, I have to say, it was not, it's really, I, I'm really, I love the fact that it's a cross-border um, project. I think that's really important for Ireland, to having cross-border projects, no matter what they are. And I think, we were lucky to meet the South Armagh Lace Collective because they were just, they're just fantastic and they're so enthusiastic. And they actually, 
make I think they make us be enthusiastic as well so yeah I think it's a great idea and it's, I'm really looking forward to when we see the two projects um, kind of knitted together we can't launch it you know live or as you know being really there but the fact that um, two groups of women you know one in South Armagh and the other in uh, County Carlow getting together to put this project and it was a lot of work hard work but we've stuck at it and we're nearly at the end now so it could be really um, interesting to see it actually up live on um, Facebook Hello, my name is Kriya. I'm a member of Boris Lacemakers and the first slide shows you our um, profile for Facebook and also there's a quote um, to the left there and uh, I just I was fi fascinated by it. It was from uh, Cranford, a novel by Elizabeth Gaskell and I was imagining Ms. Pole saying, out of the way, we are in the throes of an exceptional emergency. This is no occasion for sport. There is lace at stake. So, to begin, the Boris lace industry was established um, during the 1840s by 1846 by Lady Harriet McMurray Kavanagh of Boris House, County Carlow. It was set up um, as a scheme to help relieve poverty of local families during the hardships of the Great Famine. Many lace enterprises were being set up around this time, particularly um, through the big houses who would um, sponsor the enterprises. Um, the wife of a local rector and the lace schools were set up by religious orders. Lace was very popular in the Victorian times, both in clothing and for household items such as placemats and bed linen. Lady Harriet um, was well travelled. Her father had been a British ambassador to the Netherlands and in her early years she travelled extensively in Europe. She kept up her travelling because she uh, loved it after her marriage to Thomas McMurray Kavanagh in 1825 and she frequently took her children with her. And it was thought that the um, Boris Lace designs which Lady Harriet herself um, illustrated herself were inspired by some of the lace she'd collected on her travels in um, Italy and Greece, lace like um, Venice lace, Genoese and Milanese. The Boris lace designs which Lady Harriet illustrated herself were inspired by some of the lace she collected on her travels. Now she uh, also was a, a, love, a wonderful um, watercolour artist as well. Boris lace designs are continuous and flowing with motifs based on nature. The shamrock, the fleur de lis, the fir tree, the pomegranate were the common motifs new used. And you may see on the bottom left hand uh, side, bottom left hand side, the, um, the kipur design. And this is where the tape was laid in constructed continuous meandering fashion and joined together by pico bars and um, this te technique is known as in bars as crag which actually might have a reference to the black stairs mountains which form a scenic backdrop to the georgian village of boris now these are stock samples from the um boris house collection and um there are four stock examples in this. Now they would have been sent to buy, to buyers as samples, and the um, they still have the original Boris Lace Industry card, which included a pattern number and a price. Overall, there are sixty three samples, which represent the standard types of lace produced over one hundred years, and these can be viewed on a tour of Boris House. 
This is just part of the Boris Co House collection, which is one of the largest collection of Irish lace in its place of origin. Sponsorship for the lace industry was a responsibility passed down to each new mistress of the estate. So it went from Lady Harriet down to her um, daughter-in-law, who was married to um, Lady Harriet's son, Arthur. And uh, Frances was, had very high standards, and legend has it that if she didn't find the work um, done well, that she would get a citizen. Uh, cut it all. <laughs> and then there is May Stock, who is the second daughter of Frances Kavanagh, and in 1908 she founded the Ballantrae lace industry at Glenath Castle in Scotland. And Ballantrae um, lace is actually identical in every detail and, and stitch technique to Boris lace. Now I have been, I did a bit of research to see could I find are there any remnants of um, the Ballantrae lace, but I couldn't find any, and it seems to have died out. And then in the 19... Um, the, 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 the Boris lace itself uh, closed in 1960s, and um, but then in the 1990s, um, the Carlo ICA Federation uh, revived the forgotten art of Boris lace, and they sought help um, from a woman called Faith Green, who was a Branscombe lace teacher from Plymouth in England, and she'd had some experience of Boris lace. Now, it wasn't a very large-scale revival, but it did result in a few people continuing to make the lace, and Ina Atkinson from that group continued to promote it, mainly through exhibitions and magazine articles and demonstrations. So now we're in 2016, um, where Mary Laurie, a renowned Australian lace maker, presented a Boris lace making workshop in Boris House. And this is where a lot of the um, Boris lace makers actually learned how to do the Boris lace. So Mary had heard about Boris lace in the 1980s, and over the years she had visited Boris House on a number of occasions. And then in 2010, Herself and a fellow Australian lace maker, Annette Meldrum, studied and catalogued the Boris House collection and wrote a book, The Boris Lace Collection, A Unique Irish Needle Lace. Along with a history of Boris lace, the book um, contains 16 graded projects for making traditional Boris lace pieces. Now, if anybody's interested in this book, you will actually find it on the Book Depository. So it's the bookdepository.com and um, they have some copies there, and um, it's free postage. And then in 2016, the group, the Boris Lace Maker, was established, and um, the, the work uh, people who had been at the workshop decided to meet monthly to work on the skills, and that's how um, the group were formed. And our aim is the revival of Boris Lace through teaching its skills, sharing its stories and making connections within the community and beyond. We held our first exhibition at the local Festival of Writing and Ideas in 2017. Since then we have various exhibitions, talks, demonstrations and workshops, often co coinciding with the National Heritage Week and local festivals such as the National Ploughing Championships, etc. So um, now you can see the tools of the trade, very simple. All you need is thread, tape and needles. Um, sharp needles to sew down the tape and um, ballpoint needle or a tapestry needle for working the lace. Now the tape we use is manufactured in Italy, but um, at the moment we we had difficulty sourcing it because the factory um, went bankrupt. But we have managed to buy as much of the lace as we can from the factory, and we are hoping that this is going to last us for quite a while. Boris lace is a tape lace technique, and the materials used are cotton thread number thirty, cotton tape four millimeters sharp needles to sew down the tape and um, as I said a ballpoint needle for working the lace. 
this particular um, slide shows you the uh, different stages. So you have um, your pattern um, copied out, and then you um, line your tape around the pattern, and then you use stitches to um, fill in, in the shamrock leaves. Now, um, the, the, this is a beginner's piece, and so you can learn anything from um, two to four uh, st stitches. And then the stitches are worked on top of the assembly. So you can see where the needle is going in there, and then um, you, the pattern comes out as you uh, connect the two, the tape place to the stitches. That's what it looks like when it's totally finished. Um, now this is a beautiful table mat that one of our lace makers did this piece to commemorate her first year at lace making and it took her 120 hours to complete but it's absolutely stunning. So if once our classes are up and running again, we will welcome people to come along and try your hand at a piece of Boris lace. It's a great way to meet people with similar interests and some people enjoy creating gifts for family and friends. Once the stitches are mastered, people are ready to experiment with their own lace designs. So um, you might wonder why the South Armagh Lace Collective um, logo is on along with our Boris Lace Makers. Well, we have um, been doing a joint project with the Sarit Tharma Lace Collective who do carry them across lace. And the project is called um, Common Threads. And each group is making a, patch, a wall hanging with lace squares. And we will have a carry them across square on our quilt and vice versa. So um, these is common threads, it's called the project is Laces Across the Border, which is fantastic. It's really wonderful to be able to work, uh, for, to work with a, a group from across the border. And um, you can see that on the tour, we will have the launch of our Laces Across the Border um, project. And it will be live on YouTube and Facebook um, live stream from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. and there will be a link on our Facebook page to join um, this launch so hopefully we will have lots of people coming to um, look at what has done. We have done stories from home, um, short film series, uh, just to say come along anyway. Thank you. Bye bye. Good afternoon, everybody. I just want to thank you all for joining us today for this, our online celebration of the Common Threads project. My name is Rosie Finnegan-Bell and I'm one of the founding members of the South Armagh Lace Collective. I'm a lace maker myself and I'm deeply, deeply proud of the fact that I come from a long line of lace makers. I'm also a local tour guide and I'm a heritage ambassador for the Ring of Gullion partnership here in South Armagh. Here we have an absolutely wonderful photograph of a lace maker sitting by the fire. And this wonderful photograph, to me, is actually a very iconic photograph. Um, but it is a photograph of my great grand aunt Bessie Morgan Fannin, who lived in the townland of Monagilla near the village of Cullaville. Now Bessie was a very highly regarded woman in the area and she was an amazing lace maker. This photograph was taken by the Northern Ireland Tourist Board in the late 60s, early 70s. And Bessie featured on the tourist brochure for the Nurian Mourne area for very many years. 
This photograph forms part of the Ulster Folk Museum collection and we're very grateful to them for giving us permission to use it as part of this project. Here we have a map of the island of Ireland and I've used this map to help those of you who are from further afield get a sense of where we are located. The area highlighted in orange is County Armagh. We're known as the Orchard County because we're famous for apple growing and apple production. But where we're located in Colleville, we are down in the very southwesterly corner of the county, at the southernmost tip of County Armagh, and actually the southernmost tip of the north of Ireland. And you can see this from this more detailed map, the area of Colleville, um, extending right out onto the Monaghan border and also with the Louth border. So effectively, if you stood at the southernmost tip of the area around Colleville, if you threw a stone, and depending on the direction of your throw, you could throw it into County Monaghan or indeed into County Louth. We're surrounded on two sides by the Republic of Ireland. I've introduced this map here because it gives a more detailed look at the centres of lace making in South Armagh. And you can see the village of Colleville and the town of Cross Maglen, extending out as far as the village of Cregan. Now, in actual fact, what we're really talking about here is a five mile square radius. It's very unusual to find any trace of lace makers outside of this area. There's documented evidence to say that at the height of the tradition, there was between 600 and 800 women making lace in this area, which is really remarkable when you think about it. It's a five square mile radius. Both Colleville and Cross Maglen were known as centres of excellence for lace making for the best part of 150 years. And on this map, you can also see how close Colleville is to the darkened line, which represents the border with the Republic of Ireland. And essentially, at the time of partition, the area around Colleville and the village of Colleville itself was severed by the border. So on the southern side in County Monaghan, you had the post office and the train station and the shops were annexed into the north of Ireland, into County Armagh. I might add that this is a large rural area and we still have Colleville County Monaghan on the map and Colleville County Armagh on the map of Ireland. But you can imagine the significant impact the installation of the border had on trading opportunities for the people around Colleville and Cross Maglen and certainly it had a huge impact on the lace makers. Sadly, very few people know about our very rich lace making tradition and it's very much an untold story. But lace has been made in this part of South Armagh for the best part of 200 years. Since the late 1820s, early 1830s. So the story of lace begins in the year 1816 when Margaret Lindsay, who was related to the Lucans from Dublin, married John Gray Porter, the then Church of Ireland rector in Donamine in County Monaghan. Margaret and John went on honeymoon to Italy and it's said that Margaret was accompanied by her sewing maid Anne Steadman on that trip. Now, by all accounts, both women were very fine needlewomen and they're said to have been enchanted by the Italian laces. So much so that they took a number of specimens back home with them to nearby Dunamine. And somewhere between the period 1816 and 1821, the two women 
after studying the Italian lace specimens in great detail, came up with an entirely new idea of making lace. They created what is essentially an applique style lace, sometimes referred to as a mixed lace, because it uses both machine made elements and handmade elements in the lace making process. So it's not really until 1821 when the first mention of a lace class emerges. And through research, uh, it's evident that the ladies began by introducing lace making classes to the female congregation of the Church of Ireland Church in Dunamine itself. And one of those members of that class is almost certainly Miss Reid of Rahans. Miss Reid was the sister of the local landlord, John Reid of Rahans. And there's an anecdotal story that she had learned to make lace with Miss, Mrs. Gray Porter and Anne Steadman. And the story goes that she was out riding on her brother's estate in and around the village of Colleville in County Armagh. And she was horrified to see women doing backbreaking work in the fields. And so distraught was she by what she saw, she endeavoured to do something about it. And she and her sister Dora, who were already involved in offering classes for literacy and numeracy to some of the local children, began offering lace classes to the female tenantry. So Miss Reid is absolutely central to the whole Carrick Macross lace story and unfortunately she never really gets the credit for that because she essentially took what was effectively a hobby and transformed it into a commercial enterprise. So Miss Reid, being the remarkable woman that she was, endeavoured to build her own school and she built this school on the outskirts of the village of Colleville in the townland of Carcamone. And what's extraordinary about this story is that this is happening in the 1830s. Here we have a single woman building a school with her own money and without any grant on her own property. And I find that absolutely remarkable because at that time women were, were very very much in the shadow of their male counterparts. So the evidence would suggest that Miss Reed dedicated the rest of her life to the school in Colleville which continued on out until the end of the century in and around 1900. Then some years later after the first ravages of the Great Famine were felt, we have a new player in the lace story, and that's Tristram Kennedy. And Tristram Kennedy is well documented in the Carrick Macross lace story. He was the manager of the Bath estate in Carrick Macross itself. So Tristram Kennedy was a very benevolent gentleman. Um, he had seen the ravages of the famine on the tenants of the Bath estate firsthand. He actually um, is reputed for refusing to collect the rents of the tenants during that time and actually got into quite a considerable amount of conflict with his, the Bath, Marquis of Bath because of it. But being the kind of man he was he had seen the merit of what Miss Reed had done with her school in Colleville and he sought to replicate her school model. He secured a grant of £100 and set about opening a series of eight lace schools in and around the area of, of Carrick Macross. And this was done in a spoken wheel fashion. So there was a central school in Carrick Macross which was responsible for developing the designs and creating the patterns and those patterns were sent out to the seven outlying schools in and around Carrick Macross. Now Tristan Kennedy very much 
deserves his place in the Carrick Macross lace story and it's really well documented. He continues to maintain his links with the Carrick Macross lace industry long after he left his position as land agent to the Bath estate. Tristram Kennedy becomes the MP for County Louth and in doing so he moves to um, London and it's said that he continued to connect with Carrick Macross Lace and opened his house as a lace agency in London and he was responsible for securing a great many orders and royal commissions during that time. So he's very much revered in the Carrick Macross Lace story. Then moving back to the South Armagh area and a number of years later Miss Reid School is still running um, but in and around the period um, of the mid 1860s there's a newcomer to the, um, the lace making story and that's Susan Core Donaldson and she was another remarkable woman way ahead of her time she had been widowed very early on in her marriage and she was left with the responsibility of supporting her only daughter. And she sets up the Erker Lace School on the outskirts of the town of Cross Midland. Now she's um, credited with sending the first local woman to design school in Dublin. Um, and she actually, um, at the height of the lace making tradition, is said to have had in excess of 200 workers working for her alone. The school won many awards and uh, was very popular. And um, there's lots of documented evidence to show that they um, exhibited at the large trade fairs in Cork and Dublin, Belfast, London and Paris. And somewhere along the line, they, her role became more of a lace agent than a lace school proprietor. Um, we know that Susan Donaldson was trading as a lace agent right up to the time of her death in 1921. And a few years later, they, the lace that we're talking about becomes formally known as Carrick Macross Lace. This happened in 1872 when a woman from the Carrick Macross area won a prize in the Royal Dublin Show. It had been called many things up until that. It was called Cambric Cutwork, it was called Colleville Lace, it was called Cross Midland Lace, it was called the Beau Travail in the Paris Exhibition of 1851. So it had had many names, but it becomes officially known as Carrick Macross Lace in 1872, a full 50 years after its original inception. And then in 1895, there's another lace school set up in the um, Cross Midland area. So effectively, we had three lace schools operating in a very small area which to me is extraordinary. Um, this lace school was set up under the auspices of Maggie McQuillan and the local parish priest Canon McGinney. Now Maggie was known to be a very fine lace maker and she had won numerous awards for her work and in fact her work was um, marketed as a gold medal product. Maggie had attended design schools to hone her design skills in the Metropolitan School of Art in Dublin before returning to Cross Midland to teach the local girls and women how to make lace. The school remained open for several years um, and it's believed that it closed because the there was no longer a need for formalised classes because women were learning and girls were learning how to make lace from their family members. So it became more of a cottage industry at this point. Um, 
and so there was less of a need for formalised classes in a school setting, although we do know that Maggie continued to offer classes in her own home. She and her sisters were um, very successful lace agents in the Cross Midland area and traded in London and Paris. She also wa um, secured a royal um, commission, which is a story for another day, but it's a, again another remarkable story. And we know that Maggie continued with her lace agency right up until the time of her death in 1921. So also at that very same time in 1895, the St. Louis Order, the convent in Carrick Macross, begins to introduce lace making classes to the children at the school. And that history is really well documented and the Louis convent have been very foremost in the Carrick Macross lace story because Long after partition, the women of South Armagh would have made lace for the convent in Carrick, as it was known. A great many of them continued right up until the 1980s, early 90s, um, selling their lace to the convent, who had secured orders for, from major buyers. So then, in and around the period, the, the 1920s, and the 1930s, there was a much less demand for lace, so there were fewer women making lace in this area. Um, but there was a resurgence, as there has always been, there's always been a wax and a waning of fortunes in lace. But at the time of the Second World War, there was a lot of American soldiers stationed in the north of Ireland, and there was a a great demand for Carrick Macross lace at that time. And one of the local women, Rosie Morris Feeney, um, from Cappy, um, had started her own lace agency and she had reinvigorated um, some of the local interest in making lace. And she had secured a great many orders um, from Belfast especially for orders for lace from the American soldiers and Rosie features largely in the story of lace making in South Armagh because she was responsible for the revival of the lace in the late 50s early 60s um, she set up classes um, as part of a government government initiative um, to revive the tradition and those classes were offered in the technical school in Cross Midland itself. Um, she also is one of the key lace agents in the area and many many of the local lace makers made lace for Rosie Finney. Moving on a few more decades um, we can't tell the story of lace making in South Armagh without talking about the well-known Mary McMahon. Mary is synonymous with lace making in the area and in fact she is responsible for keeping the tr tradition alive almost single-handedly for the last 20 years at least. Mary has taught a great many of us how to make lace and um, has offered classes in both Cross Midland and Colleville um, and has really reawakened an interest in a lot of the local women in making lace and she continues to do that. She's known affectionately as the Queen of Lace in this area but Mary herself has been a prolific lace maker all her life having learned from her mother Bridget um, who learned from her mother. Um, so she's a third generation lace maker. But Mary has made lace for the nuns in Carrick for most of her life. Um, 
and she has been responsible for making some extraordinary pieces of lace for some of the top couturiers of the age, like Sybil Connolly and Irene Gil Gilbert and David Kenna. Um, and her work speaks for itself. And her story concludes really with um, the setting up of the South Armagh Lace Collective, which is more of um, a community group interested in safeguarding the rich heritage and tradition by sharing the stories and also sharing the skills. So our focus is in trying to promote the lace story, the lace story of South Armagh and trying to tell the untold story of lace making. We are um, involved in a number of events and we, on an ongoing basis, we run monthly lace classes um, for new and um, improving lace makers. But we're really interested in working with the local community to reawaken and um, revive that interest and thankfully that is now happening and that has led to us being involved in this project the common threads project because it's only in working with other groups like boris lace makers and like the likes of limerick lace that we begin to share our stories and begin to share our skills and we as heritage lace groups across the island of Ireland are in the better position of safeguarding our traditions by working together to share from our activities and share um, from our shared experience of trying to promote these rich traditions. And I've said this countless, countless times, you can't know who you are unless you know where you come from. And I think lace making speaks to a lot of us in South Armagh and it helps us connect with all of those remarkable, remarkable women who went before us. Because not only are we um, talking about the skills and sharing the skills, but we're also telling a story and Lace making provides a, a very important commentary on the role of women in uh, an area and how they've contributed so much, not just to their families, but also to the wider um, community in terms of both the economic and um, well-being. And that story deserves to be told. So I'm going to leave it there now. I want to thank you all very much for um, staying with us throughout the, this online launch and coming to us in the very first place. I really hope it has whetted your appetite to find out a little bit more about our laces um, and maybe even inspired you to pick up a needle or a set of bobbins to learn to make lace because it's an extraordinary pastime and it's a really important thing to have um, in your repertoire especially in times like this. Lace making has been a godsend to me. Um, it's also, a, um, especially at this time when we've been so confined uh, in our own homes. And there's a remarkable, there's so many benefits to making lace. So thank you for listening. And you can find out more about our activities through our Facebook page, the South Armagh Lace Collective and also through our website www.southarmalacecollective.com Thank you.